If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Luke. We are speeding our way through this marvelous gospel. Uh, we started about a month ago, and we're already up to verse 5. So today we're going to really go forward with a quantum leap, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7. And I'll be reading out of the, the New International Version, TNIV. For those of you who don't have Bibles, we give them out free here. And you can pick those up in the, uh, uh, by the visitor's table, um, out in the gathering area, if you don't have one, because we like everyone to have a Bible, and we encourage you to bring your Bibles here. So reading out of the, the, the TNIV, the book of Luke... That's the third gospel in the New Testament. Uh, if you stick around here long enough, that part will be pretty, you know, uh, creased uh, before too long. Your Bible will just fall open to that one. But here's what it says. <clears throat> in the time of Herod, king of Judah, Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's decree, commands and decrees blamelessly. There's a double emphasis there. They're righteous, and they observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But, oddly enough, they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both well advanced in years. Let's pray for this word, and could I get some people around the auditorium who will uh, serve as intercessors for this message? Appreciate it. Father, our uh, uh, heart's desire this morning is that uh, you'd use this word to make us kingdom people. We're not interested in a nice speech or anything of the sort, God. We, we, we need to be changed, and sometimes healed, and sometimes convicted, and always challenged. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be on this word, Lord God. Uh, give it an authority that comes from you, not me. Use it, Lord God, to accomplish all that you will in the lives of every person who is here this morning. And in the lives of those who may be hearing it later on by radio or CD. Have your way, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. little background here. <clears throat> The events that Luke is uh, talking about occurred under the reign of King Herod. Uh, that means we know from history that Herod reigned from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. And most scholars date this event uh, some, probably around 7 B.C. Herod reigned for about three more years after uh, this event. So this is occurring around 7 B.C., which tells you that our calendars are all screwed up. Uh, they're about six or seven years off so far as we can tell, but it's too late to correct them now. Uh, Jesus was probably born around seven or six, at the latest five B.C. Um, it says that Zechariah, Zechariah, whose name means God remembers, um, he was a, uh, a priest, a descendant of Aaron, and he belonged to the division of Abijah. Now the background of that is this. In the Old Testament, the descendants of Aaron were set apart as the priests who were going to minister in the temple. Their job was basically to care for the temple, to offer up the sacrifices, usually uh, in the morning and at night, and then to offer up uh, prayers on behalf of people in the morning and at night. And people would gather around the temple in the morning and at night as the priests would go into the holy place and, and uh, perform these, um, these functions. What, at the time that, uh, uh, under Herod, uh, we know that there are 24 divisions of the descendants of Aaron. They were divided up into 20, and it was considered quite an honor to serve in the temple, so they would take turns on a weekly basis. One division would come in and serve, then the other division would come in. And Zechariah was under this division that was headed up by Abijah. That's what it means when it says that he was part of the division uh, of, of Abijah. And they would draw lots as to who would actually do the sacrifices and uh, offer up the prayers. It was considered a great honor. And in this episode, Zechariah is the one who we'll find out later in the text uh, was given uh, that, that task. It says that Zechariah and Elizabeth were blameless and righteous. And, and it repeats it for emphasis. 
Uh, this is what is in uh, the, the Hebrew language called a parallelism, where it says the same thing in two different ways for emphasis. And so it says that they were righteous, and then it says they kept the law blamelessly. Now, it doesn't mean that they were absolutely without sin, because we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it does mean that in terms of, of their ritualistic observance of the Old Testament laws, they kept them meticulously. Now, the reason why they emphasize that uh, Zechariah was a priest and a descendant of Aaron, and that he and his wife were both uh, holy and, and blameless, keeping the law uh, meticulously, is because it sets up the surprise of verse 7. And the surprise of verse 7 is that they were without child. And they were well advanced in years, which means they were no longer capable of having children, at least not in natural terms. And the reason that that is surprising is because it was a cultural assumption, going back to the Old Testament, that if you walked with God, one of the blessings that will come from God is that you'll have children. In fact, a lot of children. And if you don't have children, that is one sign that you're not blessed by God. Now, it wasn't just a cultural assumption. It was rooted in the Old Testament, or at least they thought it was rooted in the Old Testament. Uh, you find this in a number of passages, but uh, one of the main ones is, is Deuteronomy 28. And I'll bring together a couple of verses here just to kind of show you this, uh, this Old Testament perspective on having children. Moses says this in Deuteronomy 28. He says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his co the commands I give you today... The fruit of your womb will be blessed. <clears throat> the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of, of your ground. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God, the fruit of your womb will be cursed. And so it seems here, and this was the common understanding in Israel, that if you're walking with God, if you're holy, you're going to have children. Everything's going to prosper. So if you're not having children and prospering, they're, 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 it looks like God's not blessing you. And this would cause Zechariah and Elizabeth uh, no small amount of consternation, personally and socially, because here he is, one of the descendants of Aaron, uh, one of the priests who ministers in the temple, married to a daughter of, of uh, a descendant of, of, of Aaron. So there's this holy lineage, and yet they don't have children. And it raises the question, why? No doubt uh, in the minds of some of the people, they would wonder, why Zechariah, though he looks so holy, why isn't it that they have any children? No one's going to carry on this righteous descent uh, that they're a part of. And it would raise suspicion in the eyes of people towards Zechariah and Elizabeth. Later on, Elizabeth will say that it's an, it was an utter disgrace. It was considered a shame for her not to have children. And yet, here it is, it seems as though it's a clear promise in the Old Testament, the passage raises up this paradox or conundrum, maybe even contradiction. How is it that a promise of God cannot be fulfilled? What do you do when it looks like God doesn't keep his promises? That's why I want to entitle this message, But You Promised. But You Promised. Lord, we don't have any children and we're too old to have children. And, and you promised that if we walked with you, we would have children. What do you do? What do you do when it seems like God doesn't come through on his promises? What do you do when you're just disappointed with God? When you really were led to expect something from God that didn't come to pass? I think this is a far more pervasive problem than we usually let on. It's one that is really quite personal for me right now. Um, I, I shared this a little bit uh, some time ago. I want to go over it again because it, it, it really has impacted me in a profound way. Uh, last year, I took a hit theologically that I, I have not fully recovered from, to be honest with you. Um, we were over in Cambodia uh, working with Wynne Tranberg, who's a doctor from our, our uh, congregation who's ministering to the Vietnamese people in Cambodia. Uh, you don't find people on the planet that are more poor than these folks. And um, uh, we were over there with a the team and, and just ministering with her and doing some things, having a, a, a great time. I mean, it was really a, a blessed time. Uh, towards the end of our stay there on a Saturday night, I and Wynn and some others were having a discussion. And we were talking about 
really the need not only to, 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 tempt, to demonstrate the love of Christ by bringing medicine to these people, though we definitely need to do that, and bringing food to these people, though we definitely need to do that. But we talked about the need to really pray for these people and, and believe God to see miracles happen in, in this village. They haven't made a lot of progress in spreading the gospel in these Vietnamese villages. And there's a number of reasons for that. Part of it is just the, the Buddhist Hindu culture of Cambodia. But a part of it is that the people, they live hand to mouth on a daily basis, even hourly basis. They are in a survival mode. And they're not really impressed much with ideas or concepts or theology. That's not where they're at. Where they're at is, how can your God help me survive better than the gods I'm now serving? And uh, the fact that there's a lot of uh, cultures, third world countries, where, where this is the case. What matters is demonstrating the power of God. Uh, and we were talking about how if, we, if, if there's one kid who, who, who got up and who was lame but now could walk, or a blind man that could now see, uh, some demonstrable miracle in this village, what that would do to turn that village around and, and bring them to Christ. And so we, we're talking about just the need to believe that and how that's, that's a biblical principle, and we need to move forward on that. Next morning, I was preaching in this uh, church through a translator. And at the end of the service, this young little girl in a wheelchair, uh, her name is Mai. I, I'd fallen in love with Mai that week. In fact, we'd all fallen in love with Mai that week that we were out there. She was just this angelic uh, little girl. Just loved her. Such a personality. Um, and she gave me this little this note that I took to win and had it translated. And the note basically said this, Pastor Boyd, thank you so much for coming and, and being a part of, of this ministry. And you blessed us so much. Will you take me home with you? <laughs> and she said, yeah, you know, could you take me back to America? Because if I go to America, the doctors there can heal my legs and help me to walk. And I want to play with the other kids. As it is, we saw this happening several times. Uh, this culture is not really big on political correctness. And, and some of the kids would take her legs, which were just like rubber, and they, they would kind of slap each other and slap her with them. And it, it was their way of playing. And, 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 and she just wants, she said, I, I want to play with the, the other kids. And also, my wheelchair's broken and I can't get around. Could you get me, a, you know, if I go there, I can get a new wheelchair. And when, she, when we read that part, we all just got our wallets out and, did, and basically emptied them to the pastor saying, get her a chair. Uh, but I asked when, uh, I said, is there anything that we can, that a doctor in the United States, any doctor could do for this little uh, beautiful girl? And she said, there's not. Uh, the, the kind of condition she has, if it was caught very early on, maybe in the first year, they could have slowed down the atrophy of her legs but now there's too much attrition. It's irreversible. There's nothing anyone could do for her. Uh, we can get her a chair that will help her get around on these bumpy dirt roads that uh, are in this village. But there's nothing we can do for her. And we decided to, since this, this young girl was living on this dream, this was her hope. Uh, I'll just make it back to the States and then I'll be able to walk again. And we, we, we decided that it would be best to tell her the, the truth, and which we did. And, and there is nothing, I don't think, more painful in life than watching the hope uh, in a little girl's eyes just grow cold as she begins to bawl because the just cry because of the dream of her life is now gone. And that's when Wynn said, you know, but there's one thing we can do. Like Peter in Acts chapter 3 says with a guy who was crippled all of his life, said he was begging. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And Wynn said, you know what we were talking about last night? Well, this is a good time to put it to the test. And so we gathered around here and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. I don't think I have ever prayed more passionately in my life. I, I just, I, we, we rebuked the devil. We, we, we came against the, the infirmity. Uh, we, we spoke against it. We called on the power of God. We stood on the authority of the cross. We just interceded and interceded. You know, I don't know how long, but, 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 but we just, we were just so bent on this. And after however long a period of time it was, finally the prayers kind of trickled off, and she was still in that wheelchair. And there was a part of me, to be honest with you, that, that 
that just broke. It just broke. It, it, it was like I, I said, oh, you know what? I don't ever want to pray for a sick person again. I, I, that's not right. That, that's wrong. But that's what happened. It, part of me just went, damn it. Why can't she be healed? And I've had a thing in my life where I, I, uh, I never, you know, part of my upbringing is that I don't like to be disappointed. I'd, I'd rather expect the worst. I can deal with that. But when I expect the, something good and then it, I get disappointed, it just something breaks in me. And it's something broke here. It's like, I, okay, fine. I, I can deal with a world where no one gets healed. Tell, just, just tell me that and I'll live that way. But, but to have your hopes up and just praying so hard and then it falls to the ground and it just, something in you just gets crushed. Especially, it's like, Lord, the, the miracle, this, and see, I got the theology. I wrote the book on the topic, all right? I know the variables of creation. And I can explain this intellectually. But when I'm looking at this little girl's eyes, that doesn't really help a whole lot. You see what I'm saying? It's just something you just get disappointed. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, God, okay, this could be it, man. This, this could turn the village around. It's not just for this kid's sake, but wow, the work of God could just erupt here. And you get nothing. And, and I, 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 I've been kind of reeling from that. Uh, you know, that was part of what my dark night of the soul was about last year, just trying to sort all that out. But it happens in a lot of different ways. We get disappointed with God. My dad, who was, uh, you know, I wrote letters from a skeptic with, he, was, he thought he was an atheist, but it really it turned out this. He, I don't think he really disbelieved in God. He just was really disappointed with God because God didn't heal my mother when I was two years old and she died of leukemia. And it was easier for him to accept that God didn't exist than, than to accept that God did exist but didn't uh, want to heal my mom. I think most atheists are just disappointed with God. I think there's a lot of believers who, who, who kind of just walk through life because they're disappointed with God. And it happens in a lot of different ways. There's a lady I, t I spoke with uh, about, two, uh, about a year and a half or, or two years ago. And, and here, here was, she was in a really bad place. And, and the bad place beca came because she thought that Acts 16.31 was a promise to her. Acts 16.31 says this. Uh, Paul says to the Roman guard, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. As, and she thought it was a promise of God that if she becomes a believer and walks with God, her ho whole house will be saved. Now, the problem was that she had a young son, or a son who, while he was young, was really on fire for God, but about the age of 14, started hanging out with the wrong crowd, got into drugs, got into trouble, got into some crime, and then at the age of 17 was driving around, making trouble with some friends, higher than a kite, had got in a car wreck and died. And I told her, you know, that, that doesn't mean that he was not saved. We don't know those sorts of things. You know, you got to let God's mercy be God's mercy and all of that. But the more fundamental question is, she was asking, why didn't God honor this promise? She took it as a promise, and now, now she was mad at God. Or she wondered, maybe she wasn't saved, and that's why her, her son wasn't saved. These kind of things can really mess with our mind. They can screw us up. What I want to do here in the next 20 minutes is go through four principles that I think can help us kind of sort through, uh, think through the issue of uh, what happens when you're disappointed with God, when you feel like God lets you down. And we just got to be honest with this and put it out there on the table. First of all, make sure that you haven't misinterpreted a biblical promise. Make sure you haven't misinterpreted a biblical promise. It's so important that we read the Bible in context and in a balanced way. Because a lot of times we take things that we think are unconditional promises to us that were never meant to be that way. For example, the Deuteronomy 28 passage, that if you walk with God, uh, your womb will be fertile. You need to understand that that passage, <clears throat> that was part of a specific covenant to Israel. That was part of this whole thing where God was teaching the Israelites how to walk in covenant relationship with him. God was, treating, it was dealing with humanity at, a, as a sort of, at an infantile stage. And so God was giving immediate temporal rewards for obedient, obedience and immediate temporal punishments for disobedience. You know, kind of the way we, we give cookies as immediate rewards to kids. And so he set up this whole covenant basically saying, walk with me and watch, things will go good. Don't walk with me and watch, things will go bad. And he's trying to train them how to walk with him. There's a specific covenant, and this promise is specific to that covenant. It's not meant to be for all times and all places and all individuals that whoever believes can, can uh, have the promise that uh, they'll, they'll uh, have children. 
Here's a general rule of interpretation, and hear this. If there's a promise in the Old Testament that's not repeated in the New Testament, be careful about applying it to yourself. Because chances are that that is something very specific for Israel, for that time, for that place. But it's not a universal rule, a universal promise to all people. God at this time was trying to really grow Israel because he wanted them to be a priest to the entire world. And that was one of the reasons why he built into their obedience thing this idea of, of having a lot of kids. But it doesn't apply to all people at all times. But the second thing is this. Note that even in Deuteronomy 28, the promise is to the group as a whole. Generally speaking, if you walk with me, because they always thought in terms of community, not individualistically. You as a whole, you, 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 you'll be prosperous. Your, your wombs will, will bring forth children. But it didn't mean that every, and it was never applied individually, that that means that every individual Israelite is going to have a fertile womb. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean, therefore, that for every indiv- even in the Old Testament, that every individual Jew, uh, if you walk with God, you can have the assurance that you're going to have children, and that if you didn't walk with God, that was one indication that, uh, or that if you didn't have children, that was one indication that you're not walking with God. It's so important to read things in their historical context. In Acts 16, for example, uh, Paul does say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. But it's important to understand what's going on there. Uh, the, Paul, there's an earthquake that the Lord sent to get Paul out of prison. This jailer is ready to kill himself because uh, if, you, if a prisoner escaped under your watch, you were tortured to death. So he thought, well, I might as well just end it really quick now. Paul says, save yourself. Don't kill yourself. But rather, not only physically save yourself, but believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And don't just do it for your sake, but do it for your family's sake. Now, you need to understand that in the first century culture, as in many cultures today... The man decided the faith of the whole family. Whatever religion the man of the household embraced, everyone in the household was supposed to embrace. One of the scandals of Christianity is that we have women who are embracing a different faith from their husband. That's what 1 Corinthians 7 is all about. And and, uh, Christianity empowered people to make their own decisions on these sorts of things. But in the ancient world, as in many cultures today, if the man embraced a religion, everybody else just assumed that he's the boss and therefore we're supposed to follow his God. So it makes sense in the first century for Paul to say, you'll be saved, and of course, uh, your household will be saved, uh, including your servants, because they always will follow your faith. But we can't take that and apply it to our lives today as though when you became a believer, that meant that your children have no longer have any free will. Of course they continue to have the free will, and they have to decide on their own, because we live in a very different culture than they did. So the first principle is, in, in reading the Bible, understand it in its historical context. Um, and be very careful about generalizing things that you find uh, in, in these particular contexts. A second very important point is this. Understand the hyperbole of the Bible. Understand the hyperbole of the Bible. You need to understand that Semitic languages like Hebrew, they had no punctuation. Uh, they, no commas, uh, you know, no periods, no exclamation points. Uh, the way that you would state something emphatically, since you couldn't put an exclamation point after it, uh, is you'd state it in an exaggerated form. And you find this happening throughout the Bible. This is probably one of the most common ways that people today misinterpret uh, the Bible because they don't understand the language. Uh, you, you state something in absolute terms, unconditionally, sometimes in ridiculous forms, in order to, to drive home a point about how, how important it is. Uh, that's why Jesus says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you. Well, he doesn't mean that literally. He's just saying it's really important that you, that you, that you guard what your eyes see and guard what your hands do. Even in Mediterranean cultures today, if you go to a Mediterranean culture and, and, and you do some bargaining, you go to the, mar- the market, and you offer a, uh, you know, something for these boots, you might get a response like this. You insult my mother's grave. I've never heard such a ridiculous offer in my life. To the ends of the earth, never has a, such a stupid offer been made. <laughs> and of course, probably he has heard more stupid offers, but it's his, it's his emphatic Mediterranean way of saying, no. 
Yeah. No with an exclamation point. And everyone understands that it's not to be taken uh, uh, that literally. Now, a lot of people get messed up because they, we interpret this hi hyperbolic language in Western terms as though it's meant literally. Here's one passage that has screwed a lot of people up. The passage doesn't screw people up, but the interpretation of the passage screws people up. I don't want anyone going out of here saying, yeah, the pastor said that the Bible will screw you up. No. <laughs> but you need to interpret it right. It says in, in, in Proverbs 22, start children off or train children on the way that they should go. And when, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Okay, it's a very important principle. Now, I have met more than a few people who have thought that that was a promise of God, that if we just teach our kids the right way to go, we have a promise from God that they'll never leave the faith and they'll never become immoral. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work that way. And so I've met people who, who have kids who give up on the faith and sometimes turn out to be pretty devious people. And then the parents are left with this. Either we didn't raise them right, so we should blame ourselves, or God didn't honor his promise, so we must blame God. And neither of those are real helpful conclusions to come to. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other Christians out there who will agree with them on that. Yeah, you know, because they want the assurance that if I just do all the right things, this is why sometimes uh, parents get so controlling because they, they sincerely want to do the right thing. And they, they, they ha the other side did that if we just do the right thing, then we have this assurance that things will turn out all right. Sorry, your kids didn't turn out right, but that must be your fault because my Bible says that if I train kids in the right way, then they'll never depart from it. But see... If we read it in its original context, the author knew, as we all know, that so kids can be raised in, the, in an absolute perfect environment, like my kids were, and, and yet that's still not an assurance that, that they're going to turn out right. There are people who, who are raised in perfect homes who turn out to be mass murderers, and then there are people who are raised in atrocious homes, and they turn out to be saints. They, they, we can't, they, there's a principle here, but it's not a magical formula. In fact, I could kind of sum up everything I'm saying right here by just saying, read the Bible for principles, but not for magic. Uh, the, the, the author is saying it's really, really important to raise kids right, because it is. And the way that they emphasize that is by stating it in these unconditional terms. But of course, your kids still have free will. You know, Adam and Eve fell, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking they probably had the best parent in the world, all right? Uh, there's this thing called free will, but it's very important that you raise kids up right. Matthew 21 is another one that has messed a lot of people up. Or the interpretation has messed a lot of people up. Jesus said, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. I was at a, a conference one time and I was discussing the problem of evil and all the variables that affect the outcome of things and whatnot. One person at the end, it, it was a Q&A, and they came up and they said, well, you can have all your principles and all these things and make the world so complex, but my Bible says that if I ask anything and I believe, I will receive. Hallelujah. I said, really? Uh, anything you ask, that it literally will come to pass. And you, and you believe that. And they go, absolutely right. I asked them, I said, have you found that that's true in your experience? And they actually said, yes. So then I said, oh, then we have got the, the, the goose that laid the golden egg here. Uh, will you please ask for peace in the Middle East? <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, right now. And, and then ask for uh, the ending of the AIDS epidemic in Africa because it's really getting out of hand there. And then, then let's just, like, eradicate all crime in the world. And, and you know, I just started going on. Now, it, haven't you thought about asking for that? And I was try, just trying to make this point. Uh, she knows at some level that she ha you don't get everything you ask for. It just common sense life experience will tell us that the passage can't be taken literally. If, if, it, if it could be taken literally, I'm thinking we could get rid of all the world's problems here in the next 20 minutes. But it doesn't quite work like that. There are even other passages in the Bible that qualify this one. If you ask anything according to my will, for example, the Lord says. If you ask anything accor you know, according to your faith bit under you, or according to the faith of the person that you're praying for. There's actually a number of variables that the Bible talks about that affect w whether prayer comes to pass. And sometimes it's got nothing to do with people. It's got nothing to do with God. You read uh, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel prayed. He believed, but he did not receive for 21 days, not because it wasn't God's will, and not because he didn't pray in faith, but because there's this prince of Persia, this spiritual being, that intercepted the answer to the prayer and delayed the whole thing. The world is a complex place. We can't, there's a principle here. 
And the principle is it's very, very important to pray and believe. But it's not magic. It's not a formula. Because the world is a far more complex place than that. And this one in particular is very, very important. Because we've got a whole segment of Christianity out there that are walking with, and they're sincere, wonderful people, but they're, they're, they're claiming a promise that just isn't there. Not if you understand it in the original language. They believe that, if, that they can have the assurance that if you just walk with God and just believe enough, you will never be sick. And if you are sick, that's a sign that you've got sin in your life or you lack faith. You'll never have cancer. You'll never get disease. In fact, if you just believe and receive, you'll, you, you can be rich. Because the Bible says whatever you ask in prayer. So ask for that Mercedes Benz. Oh Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? And, and ask for that Porsche and ask for the Cadillac and get the nice house. And they believe that they have a right as a child of the king to have all this stuff. And the real downside is that when it doesn't materialize, they either blame themselves because they think they lack faith or they blame God for not honoring the, uh, his promises. And both of those are very bad conclusions to come to. I have... I could tell you horror stories of people that I have had to minister uh, to who have been in context like that, and they came down with cancer, or their kid came down with cancer, or they entered into poverty. And when, then what happens is the community, whether they say it or not, there's this kind of this assumption that, well, it's your own fault. And right when you need people the most, you feel shunned by them, and right when you need God the most, you feel shunned by him. And I'm here to tell you that that it just isn't a promise in the word of God. In fact, Jesus promises us that in this world we'll have trials. He promises us that in John 16. Now, how would you square that? What, 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 what if we ask, Lord, we don't want any trials? If you take this verse literally, it seems like we're saying, okay, Lord, you'll, get, you'll keep us free from trials. But he also promised us, uh, uh, promised us that we would have trials. How do you reconcile that? The way you reconcile it is by understanding that this is, this is normal, uh, uh, biblical hyperbole. Take it as an important principle, but it's not a magic formula. Number three. Number three. got to go through this one fast, but this is important. All these principles are important. Having said all that, we need to believe in the possibility of miracles. Having said all, all the qualifications and understanding the Bible in its original language, we need to believe that God <clears throat> can come through in the 11th hour and do miracles. In fact, that's the point of the passage that we're reading this morning in, in Luke chapter 1. Um, uh, later on, we'll see that Zechariah and Elizabeth did conceive. They conceived John the Baptist. God miraculously came through, even though they were beyond the, the normal years that you can have children. God can do the miraculous. Now, that doesn't mean that every couple that is childless is going to have a miraculous conception, nor does it mean that if they don't have a miraculous conception uh, that, that, God, that, that they lack faith or, or there's some sin in their life. But it does mean this. We need to believe that God can do the miraculous. We need to understand that miracles were a central part of Jesus' ministry. And it wasn't just about giving out little candy to people who had needs. It was his way of demonstrating that the kingdom of God had come. The dome in which God is king was present in his ministry. And that is to be manifested not just in a social way, not just in an emotional way, not just in a spiritual way, but even in a physical way. What the miracles of Jesus demonstrate is that when the kingdom of God takes hold, the kingdom of Satan begins to diminish. And the more you have of the one, the less you have of the other. And that means that where the kingdom of God is present, things begin to line up with God's will and begin to manifest God's character. Which means this, and hear, hear this, where God reigns, sickness is to flee. Where God is reigning, disease is to be healed. Where God reigns, cancer is to be routed. Where God is reigning, Satan's reign is, is, uh, is, is diminishing, which means that sin is being overcome. Marriages will be healed. Walls will be torn down. People will begin to find that they've got a capacity to love that they never had before. The miraculous begins to be displayed. The supernatural power of God begins to be displayed on every level of life, and that includes the physical level of life. Miracles are to be the norm in the, the, the kingdom of God. And, and that's why Jesus said, it's not just that I'm going to do these things. But he said, I give you power to cast out demons. I give you power to heal the sick. I give, I give you the authority to make the blind see. 
That's part of what the church is to be doing. It's not magic. It's not magic, and it's not a guarantee that everyone we pray for is going to be healed. But it is a command that this is how we're to march. This is how we're to walk. This is how we're to believe, and this is what we expect to see. Now, I struggle with this, and I suspect a lot of you do too. I'm still reeling from the hit I took last year in Cambodia. And it's hard for me to, to really believe this and, and walk in, in, in this. On top of that, I see a lot of carnival stuff out there where you have people doing healing ministries and, and, and what they're doing is just creating a little smoke and mirror game show and to get people to come and all, you know. And I don't want anything to do with that kind of, that kind of carnival Christianity. But on the other hand, we can't let... Uh, the, the, the people who abuse this and our own experience define our theology. Our theology is to be defined by the word of God, not our own experience and not our paranoia about people who abuse it. And so where I'm at in this whole thing is this. I'm like the, I'm like the father in, in Mark chapter 9 who, who had a son who was demonized. And the disciples, even though they cast out a lot of demons before, they weren't able to cast the demon out of this kid. And, uh, and, and so he brings him to Jesus, and Jesus says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Now, the guy just saw a failure uh, of, 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 with the disciples. So he was honest about it. Faith isn't a little gimmick we do in our head, you know, kind of the lion on the Wizard of Oz who says, I do believe, I do believe, I do, I do, I do believe. It's not a psychological gimmick. It's just about trusting God. And so the guy says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, because right now I'm kind of discouraged, and, I, and your disciples just failed on this one. So I'm having trouble here, but, but, I, but I, I, I believe, and yet I, I kind of don't believe. You know, God takes that. Uh, just be honest with God. And so where I'm at is this, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I, I, I'm, I'm having some difficulty with this, but I want to see this happen. Faith, faith is, is, it says in Hebrews 11, is your vision of the future. It's what you expect. It's what you're moving towards. It's not a guarantee, and it's not a psychological gimmick. It just, it's just what you're willing to act on. And I believe to the point where I'm willing to act on this. I want to be praying for the sick. I want to be praying for marriages. I want to see people begin to be healed. I want to see God high and lifted up. That's one of the reasons why we're going to be incorporating it into our services now. More time to pray for, for people and do intercession. And I want, to, I want us to be believing to see God healing people. I'm talking about getting out of wheelchairs, to be believing God for that. And we're encouraging people in their small groups to be praying for one another. When you're sick, pray for one another. And to be praying individually. And when, when, when God does something in your life, you have this responsibility, and that's to glorify God for doing it, which means you brag on God. You just testify. And so call it in. We want to know about it. We want to be, be spending some time on our weekend services where we're highlighting this stuff. Here, here's what God did over here, and here's what God did over there, because that inspires more faith, and according to your faith being unto you. The more we believe, the more we receive of it, the more we receive of it, the more we believe it. Expect God. Anticipate God. Believe that God is able to do the miraculous. And so some of the things that, that uh, you believe he's promised you, as, as God leads you, believe. Don't, don't tire in that. Persist in faith. And my final point, and I'll end with this very quickly. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because you know what? You can, uh, you can uh, interpret the Bible exactly right. Again, you can be walking in faith for miracles, but I guarantee you there will be times where, where, where it's not going to make sense. There will be times where, where the, your experience and your theology contradict each other. Uh, no matter how well you think it out, life is just like this. The world's a complex place, and there'll be times where you believe that God should do this, but your experience says this. You'll be in the position of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And in those situations, the only thing you can do is keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ and know that God's heart towards you is the heart expressed on Calvary. Don't let your circumstances and even your confusion pollute your picture of God or to begin to call into suspicion God's character. Rather, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Because the reality is this. Life can often be ugly, but God is always beautiful. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Life can be really cruel, but God is always good. Life can be sometimes profoundly unfair, 
But, but God, if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, God is not only fair. No, no, he, he's not just just. He's outrageously merciful. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1 that all the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. When you, when you grab hold of Jesus Christ, you grab hold of all that God has promised. And whether you receive it now or whether you receive it later, it's all found in the person of Jesus Christ. Can we stand? And I just want to close in, in prayer. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, you're not related to him. Maybe you know him intellectually, but your life isn't surrendered to him. I encourage you this morning... To come up here and to my right, your left, we have a table. And there'll be a person up here who would love to explain to you uh, what it is to become a disciple. We have a CD and, and a Bible and some other things that can really help you get started on that Christian walk. And if you're here this morning and you uh, didn't uh, have a chance to be prayed for around the auditorium or you'd like to be prayed for again, our prayer team will be up here. And I encourage you to come forward uh, with that as well. Let me close with this prayer. Father, as we go out of this place... I pray, Lord, that you would be in the process of healing us, healing us from uh, disappointments, hits that we take along the way. Lord, help us to read your word persistently and in a balanced way. And Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you and to always trust in your character. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. We want to see, Lord, your kingdom come on every level of life. We want to see you high and lifted up. And so, Lord, as a group and individually, help us to be believing that you are a God who does miracles. And so that we, as a corporate whole and individually, can begin to look more and more like Jesus Christ, not just in how we love, though that, yes, certainly, but in how we are able to take authority over sickness, disease, cancer, and other things that afflict people. Help us to go out of here with your, the character and the power of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said one more time. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go out and do the kingdom.